In Hebrews 12, go over there, please. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that's set before us. Looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and did what? He despised the shame. Instead of receiving people despising him and despising along with them, he despised the shame. And is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Uh, you, you've not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin, and you've forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to children. My son, do what? Despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you are rebuked of him. When he corrects you, don't despise it. Do you know a lot of time he corrects you through other people? Yes. <laughs> well, we got a big response off of that one, didn't we? Did you feel the surge of excitement? A lot of times it'll come through other people. And when it does, what are you supposed to do? When I was seven, eight, nine, uh, going to school, <laughs> I won't go into all of it, but there was, we come from the deep south, and there was some family deals that weren't I ideal. You ever heard of the Hatfields and McCoys? <laughs> well, there was just two in, in, in my immediate family, myself and my younger brother that was three years old, younger than me. And uh, there were uh, man, I don't know, eight of these other boys, and most of them were older and bigger than me. And uh, I got beat up. <laughs> My little brother couldn't back me up. And I mean, sometimes on the school bus, a couple, two or three of these guys would hold me down while the other one beat me up. And I'd get off the bus with a bloody nose and a bloody lip. And my dad said, boy, we got to do something with you. And he put me in a school of martial arts. 
old school. We practiced on cement floors with no pads. And it, it helped me. It did me a lot of good. It really did. And uh, one of the instructors, well, all, this was just the mentality of the whole place. Uh, they would tell you to do something. And if you didn't do it, the next thing you would feel would be a foot or a hand. And uh, you know, they'd show you the stance. They'd show you the punch. They'd show you the kick. And, and if they come back and told you and you weren't paying attention, when words didn't suffice, <laughs> the foot did. And, and a, a common thing was to sweep your feet out from under you and bounce you off the floor, cement floor. And uh, the correct response was, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Everybody practice that one time. <laughs> thank you, thank you sir. sir. Why? Because for some reason you're not getting it. And they're helping you to get it. And it really worked. You tended to just pay more attention, especially when the sensei got close. Man, those, those punches sharpened right up and those kicks got brisk. But, you know, you can say what you want to, but a lot of that was about showing respect. Showing respect to the forms, to your instructors, to what was being taught, to what was being said and done. And you can go overboard with that. But at the same time, much of the world now today is far too loose. Yes. Would you agree? Yes. Far too loose. Anything goes. Everything goes. And if you go to correct somebody, oh man. You're, they're not liable enough to even show up the next day. And next thing you'll hear is you're being accused of verbal abuse. Shall we talk about this just a moment? <laughs> Did you know the Lord actually spoke to my heart about this one time? Because I, I was thinking, Lord, well, what? You know, so many folks are so sensitive. They wear their feelings on their sleeve. You, 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 they will receive no correction. If it's not a compliment couched in soft tones, they won't receive it. Correction, much less a rebuke. Does the Bible talk about yeah. instruction, yeah. correction, yeah. and also rebuke? Is rebuke fun? No, no, not when you're being rebuked. It's not fun. Do you ever need a rebuke? Yes. <laughs> that was a part of the crowd. <laughs> Do you ever need correction? Yes. Have you arised, arrived at Christ-like perfection in your walk? No. Then I reckon you, you and I need some correction, yes. don't we? And if you get some correction, should you despise it? No. Or should you be thankful that it's helping you, that somebody cares enough about you? Amen. Right? Yes. To be willing to put up with you not enjoying it. <laughs> yeah. I've had people say, well, I love my kids too much to correct them. No, you don't love them enough. Amen. You can't stand them being miffed at you or the feelings that you have to deal with. You'd rather let them go and get in trouble. And it might not seem that big of a deal now, but if it's not fixed, you're going to have major problems on your hand when they hit those teenage years. Amen. And if they don't show you respect now, they're not going to show the teacher respect, the coach respect, the policeman respect. It just goes on and on and on. Amen. Right? Amen. But the Lord corrects those he loves. Amen. Doesn't he? Yes. Why? Because he doesn't want you going off the cliff. Amen. I, I, you know, in flying airplanes... You have to make course corrections. And I mean, flying from Florida to California, if you're off a couple of degrees, you wind up in Portland, Oregon. <laughs> because over a period of 2,000 miles, it just gets, the, the, the gap just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. And you have to make course corrections. And I've asked people before, you know, if we're flying along, and all at once I realize there's a mountain there in the windshield, would it be okay if I made a drastic course correction and caused you to spill your Coke yeah. and maybe even half throw you out of your chair? Would that be, would that be okay? Yes. Sometimes small corrections suffice. 
But if you're off course enough, you need a big correction. And you may need somebody yelling, get out of the way, change, move now, move now. And if you go, you're yelling at me, you're yelling. (laughs) Well, run into the mountain then, I guess. Some correction needs to be abrupt because it's serious and it needs to happen now. What that means is you didn't make a lot of little corrections for a long time and now you're in trouble. (laughs) But in thinking about this, uh, I'm just checking my heart about it. And I'm not talking about being mean. For, I'm not just talking about yelling for no reason. We ought to be kind all the time. Amen. But if you're about to run off the cliff, that is kindness yeah, it is. for somebody to shout at you Amen. and get your attention. Yeah. And the Lord uh, spoke, spoke to my heart. He said, yes. He said, uh, if I had operated and lived in your day, I would have been accused of verbal abuse. Really? The Lord would have been accused of verbal abuse? Well, think about it. Think about it. Have you, have you read the gospel accounts? Have you read them? Did he ever speak sharply to people? Did he? You vipers. How are you going to miss hell? When you make a convert, you make him twice the child of hell that you are. Direct quote. (laughs) He didn't talk like that all the time. But there were times he did. He reminded me of the situation of Peter walking on the water. And I I hadn't thought about it like this, but it it, it just unfolded like this to me in my mind. He helped me to see it. To understand that phrase, if he had lived today, some would have accused him at times of verbal abuse too. The scenario where Peter's walking on the water, but then he got to looking at the wind and waves, and he began to sing, cried out, Lord, save me. And the Lord grabbed him. And what did the Lord tell him? What did he say? Where's your faith? Why did you doubt? That would have been a lot of people. They would have been at their therapist the next day. And they'd have been explaining. I left everything, everything for him. I walked away from it all. We've been there with him night and day, early and late, long, hard, hot, cold. And did you see anybody else getting out of the boat that night? I don't think so. Do you know how many people in the record of the earth have walked on the water? (laughs) Jesus and me for a little while. (laughs) And does he say, good job, Peter? (laughs) Does he say, all right, Peter? You walked on the water, just you and me. He's the only one that ever have. No. He says, where's your faith? Where's your faith? Why'd you doubt? I can't take it anymore. That is not enduring hardness as a good soldier. That's being a whiny baby. Whiny baby. Look at your neighbor. Help him out. Say, don't be a whiny baby. Don't be a whiny baby. If you get corrected, I'm not saying it'll make you feel good. I'm not saying it'll make you happy. Sometimes it rubs your flesh the wrong way. You'll be tempted to get mad, to get upset. But here's the correct response. Thank you, sir. sir. (laughs) Helps me out. He said, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you are rebuked of him. Don't despise it. Skip down to verse 15. He's talking about what happened with Esau. 
Can you see all this flows together? He kept talking about despising and not despising. And now he's talking about Esau because he is one of the big examples in the Bible of somebody that despised a holy thing of God. He said, verse 15, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of bread sold his birthright. Whose birthright was it? It was his. Who did it belong to? Him. From who? From the Lord. Did he lose it? Yes. yes, he did. Did somebody else wind up with what was his from the Lord? Yes, yes that's a revelation we need to get. Amen. All this is not set in stone. It's yours if you'll value it. If you'll esteem it, if you'll honor it, if you'll appreciate it. Verse 17, you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Now this is how real the blessing is. You remember the story, how that after this happened, I guess years passed, some time passed, and Esau and Jacob's dad's about to die and go home. And it's time for him to bestow the blessing on the firstborn. And uh, Jacob figures, I bought this thing. It's mine. And him and his mom framed up to go in and pretend that he's his brother. And for his dad to pronounce the blessing of the birthright of the firstborn on him. And they did that. And Esau was also, he was, he was planning on coming and getting it, even though he had sold it to his brother. And uh, when uh, Jacob came in and his father said, well, come close to me, because he couldn't see. He was old and had lost most of his vision. And he said, uh, well, now you, uh, you smell like Esau because he had his clothes on and stuff. He got some Esau's clothes. And he said, uh, you know, he put that goat's hair on his arms because Esau had hairy arms. And he said, and you got, you know, the hairy arms. He said, but you don't sound like him. And I don't know how all he convinced him, but he did. And so his father spoke over him. You know, if he prayed over him, if he laid hands on him, but he spoke the blessing of the firstborn over him. Yes. These things are holy, friends. These things are precious. They, they matter. They mean something. They have power in, in life. Well, Esau comes in, and uh, his father was alarmed, and he said, what do you mean you're Esau? Esau was just in here. He said, no. No, I just, I just got back from my hunting. Here's the food that you asked for. And, and he said, no. He said, your brother has come in and taken your blessing." And he'll be blessed too. Yeah. Now see, a lot of people might, people might think, oh, well, just X that then. Uh, never mind. I'll, I'll do it for you or I'll do the same. He knew he couldn't. Yeah. These things are so real and so powerful. Amen. They're not, this is not toys. This is not playing with something. This is not just mumbling some things with no effect. He said, no, I've blessed him and he will be blessed. And man, Esau cried. He said, can't you give it to me? He said, no. Well, do you have anything for me? And so he checked his heart and he prayed over him and gave him a lesser blessing. Are these things real, Amen. saints? Amen. But whose fault was all this? Esau. Why? Because he despised his birthright. Go with me, please. Psalm 106, then we're going to Numbers 13, I believe. Do you want the good things of God in your life? Yes. You want the full blessing. You want everything that you are supposed to have in His plan for your life. Yes. Well, those that honor Him are the ones He honors. And we want to identify this despising and we want to eliminate it 
from our lives. Being respectful is godly. It's not just a, a southern thing or a this thing or a this X generation thing or a, a you know, whatever people might, they're, usually people, whatever their background is, they tend to think that's it. It's no, these are all manifestations of godliness if there is respect. Respect is godly. In contrast, disrespect is devilish. Despising, running things down, being negative about it, and, and, and devaluing it is devilish. That's how he does all the time. God sees your heart. And he sees you and I in Christ. If we hold faith in, in what he's done in Christ. And he's not looking to find faults. You reckon he could? Could he put you under the spotlight? Hmm? Well, he's not looking at that. And he's not looking for that. He's not the condemner. You and I have been justified by our faith in Christ. But now you want to be like him. When you're looking at somebody else. Or when you're looking at a situation. You want to call it what he calls it. And you want to emphasize the good and not the bad. Emphasize the good and not the evil. Now, in Psalm 106, I want you to notice what happened concerning the promised land that God selected and gave to his people. Psalm 106, 24 says, yea, they did what? Despised. They despised the pleasant land. They believed not his word, but they murmured in their tents. And hearken not to the voice of the Lord. Therefore he lifted up his hand against them. To overthrow them in the wilderness. To overthrow their seed among the nations. And to scatter them in the lands. How were they treated? Not well. In response to how they treated him. And his plan for their life. They despised the, the pleasant land. They despised the good land. From the beginning, in Exodus, before they ever got delivered out of Egyptian bondage, in the beginning of their deliverance, God was declaring to them, Exodus 3, 8, you don't have to turn there. He said, I'm come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good land and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Now you've heard that before, a good land. A land that flows with milk and honey. When God says it's a good land, what should you say? Huh? It's a good land. The first generation that he got out of Egypt that was supposed to go into, what did they say? They despised it, the Bible says. They despised it. So is it a good land or is it a bad land? Don't let this be too simple for you. This, this is vitally important. Is it a good land or a bad land? Good land. Are you sure? Yes. It would depend on who you listen to. It would depend on who you asked. Go to Numbers and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Numbers 13. This is when... They've been delivered out of Egyptian bondage. They've come through the Red Sea. Their spies have been sent into the land. It's time to go get the land. They're there. All the things they've heard about for so long, the plan of God, the time has come. So they sent 12 spies to verify exactly what was there, to get a, put their eyes on it and see. And verse 25, Numbers 13, 25, they returned from searching the land after 40 days. 
And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron, to all the congregation of the children of Israel, to the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation, and they showed them the fruit of the land. And the fruit was just off the chart. Amazing. You know the story. Had to haul the grape clusters on, on, a, on a rod between men. The, 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 you, you talk about miracle grow. <laughs> this was blue ribbon fair, you know, contest winning produce. Big, luscious, sweet tasted, amazing. They'd never seen anything like this. Well, it shouldn't be surprising. God picked it out for you. And God said, it's a good land. Didn't he say that? It's a good land. It flows with milk and honey. I've, I've selected it for you. I picked it out for you. What did they say about the land? It's a land that will chew you up and spit you out. It's a bad land. It's a, you want to die? Then go over there. It's a place of death. It's a place of ruin and destruction. Friend, this is serious business. When you call evil what God calls good. How much more disrespectful can you be? God says, it's a good land. It flows with milk and honey. It's amazing. I got it for you. He didn't tell them about the giants. He didn't want to. He's already got a plan. Right? They said they couldn't do it, but was it true? The next generation did it. Proven the first generation could have done it. But the reason they didn't is because they despised what God said was good. We trust this message has ministered to you. Faith Life Church now has two locations in Branson, Missouri and Sarasota, Florida. Service times in Branson are Friday nights at 6.30 and Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. Service times in Sarasota are Friday nights at 7.30 and Sunday mornings at 10. For more information, please visit our websites, flcbranson.org and flcsarasota.org, or call us at 417-334-9233. 